Hello and welcome to the 2023 launch of the Ecological Threat Report. We're so pleased that you could all join us today. My name is Leah and I'm the moderator for today's event. And I'm joined by two incredible panelists, Steve Killalay, the founder and executive chairman of the Institute for Economics and Peace, and Tony Renaudo, the principal climate action advisor on the climate action and resilience team at World Vision Australia. Our first presentation today will cover the findings of the Ecological Threat Report, which assesses threats related to food risk, water risk, rapid population growth, and natural disasters. Before I hand it over to Steve, I'd like to remind everyone that you may ask questions to the panelists at any time using the Q&A function that's at the bottom of the screen. We'll have time for question and answers at the end of both of the presentations. Without further ado, Steve, we look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Great, uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah. Leah, I'm uh, really looking forward to giving it. Now, I've got an interview with CNBC uh, on uh, live on uh, television, and so I've got a hard drop dead at 10 o'clock. Now, things run a little bit further, and I leave. You'll all, uh, my apologies, but you'll all understand why. So what I might do now is share my screen, and we'll get the uh, slide presentation up. Uh, Ray, can we see that? Yes. Okay, excellent. Here we go. Well, welcome to the uh, launch uh, presentation for the 2023 Ecological Threat Report. This will be a very fast-moving presentation. So uh, here we go. So the Institute for Economics and Peace, for those who don't know it, was set up to understand the intersection between business, peace, and economics, place a special emphasis on metrics to measure peace, then to ascribe an economic value to changes in peace. We have the uh, five offices in various parts of the world. It's headquartered in Sydney, Australia, but offices in New York, Mexico City, Brussels, The Hague, and uh, Nairobi in Kenya. Uh, organize, the work's used by a massive number of organisations around the world. It's really hard to quantify, but for examples, so our work is used by, we do a, a, a con track research for organisations like the UN, World Bank, ONCD, Commonwealth Secretary, uh, Rotary International, World Vision, a number of different governments such as the Philippines or the Portuguese government as well. The work's included in thousands of university courses around the world, if not more than 10,000. And last year alone, we had activities in over 30 different countries. That was sort of training, running positive peace workshops, doing on the ground consulting work. Media impressions, we're averaging about 5 billion a month. Uh, we would expect with the launch of this ETR, I was on BBC World News this morning uh, and a number of other uh, uh, publications, we'd expect the launches Probably we'll end up with about probably a thousand media articles out it for within the next week or so. So now, if we come right down to the ecological threat report, report covers two hundred and twenty one countries. That's down to about three thousand five hundred areas inside those countries, uh, and we cover we break it up into nine regions of the world. We literally cover nearly all the world's population ninety nine point nine nine percent. And it's broken up into four domains, and I'll come around a little bit more on that soon. And it's literally built up of hundreds of different data sets, which we combine, which gives us ecological vulnerability, resiliency, population growth, and much more. So as I mentioned, the four domains, it's food insecurity, water risk, demographic pressure, and natural disasters. Now, if we move under then, we come up with about 17 different indicators. And the work we're doing now is influenced by machine learning. So obviously we're moving with the times. And so in terms of particularly if we're looking at food insecurity, that's a very complex algorithm to be able to work all that out. So let's hit the key findings. So this is a quick mud map of the world. Red is very, very bad. Green is very, very good. And so obviously you can see from this, the most suppressed parts of the world, Sub-Saharan Africa, 
parts of the uh, uh, west coast of uh, Latin America. We can also see South Asia is fairly well stressed as well. So now what to note is really interesting is if you look at the green, a lot you'll see a lot of it, it's up through Europe. Uh, you'll find it also over in North America. So what we find is the countries with the highest ratings in positive peace have the highest societal resilience, and they're able best to be able to cope with their ecological challenges. And a lot of it's preemptive in terms of capturing the amount of water you need and providing the levels of food you need as well. These are also the parts of the world with the lowest population growth. So I guess the major finding is without concerted international effort, the current level of ecological degradation is going to become substantially worse. That's really going to increase the level of current, current contrasts, conflicts which are going on. And then also what it'll do is it'll create further conflict in places which aren't suffering from conflict now. And all this will just intensify a whole range of social issues such as malnutrition, forced migration, which is on the rise and we will cover. But just to drive this home, currently there's 1.8 billion people living in, uh, living in countries which face at least one or more severe ecological threats. The number of people in those countries is estimated to go up to 2.8 billion in the next uh, in the next few next 30 years up to 2050 and if we look at it today over 1 billion people are facing severe severe food insecurity and that's likely to double by 2050 and when we come down to it we'll have more of it further on sub-saharan africa is the area most at risk so really been through this but just to drive it home so that the, the this number is going up 56% in the 66 countries which are suffering from at least one severe ecological threat. Now, these effects are systemic. So in, in, what this does is it ensnares countries in contract, in conflict traps, uh, which are very, very difficult to escape. So like with what we find is you've got ecological degradation, uh, you've got poor governance, high levels of poverty, high population growth, weak, weak rule of law, and then weak social resilience, which we measure through positive peace. And that's also associated quite often in countries with very uh, high levels of climatic variability. And you can particularly see this in, the, let's say, the Sahel region through uh, sub-Saharan Africa. And all these come together cyclically to create the ecological effects we see. And then from that, that breeds violence. So if we look at it, 24 of the 30 countries with the worst uh, scores are in the bottom half of the Global Peace Index, just to bring it home. However, what we find is countries with high levels of societal resist resilience are more likely to meet their ecological challenges. Therefore, positive peace is an excellent measure being able to look at the coping capacities of societies around the world. So now, just to drive this home even further, we look at the 20 countries with the highest positive peace scores. They have no in, in, internal violent conflict, literally none. So in North America, the regions where no countries face any severe ecological threats. And again, this comes back to the strength of the societal systems, which we measure through positive peace and their ability to be able to build a resilient environment. So this gives you an idea of the various regions of the world and how they fall. Obviously, as already mentioned, Europe, North America is doing extremely well. South Asia is the second worst, and as we've already covered, Sub-Saharan Africa, which we'll have more on in a few minutes, which is now. So let's have a look at Sub-Saharan Africa. So 42 of the 52 countries in the region face severe water stress. We also find that sub-Saharan Africa accounts for 76% of the people globally facing severe food insecurity. Now, more alarmingly, the population of sub-Saharan Africa is projected to increase by 62%. So it'll move from 1.34 billion up to 2.16 billion. 
Uh, but the good news is the actual birth rates have been declining. Uh, so if we go back and look over the last 20 years, it's dropped from five women down to four women. With countries like South Africa really doing quite well, they're 2.3 births per woman. So some parts of Africa are doing better than others. I think one of the other findings in piece of the study is looking at the mega cities and how the number of mega cities are going to grow and the ecological threats which are associated with them and their inability to be able to cope with the growth. So also, if we come back and we look at the hotspot countries, they're the countries with the, you know, more than one severe ecological threat and also the lowest societal resilience. We find two-thirds of more 19 of the 30 countries are in sub-Saharan Africa. And so what happens, all this, all this works in a cyclic manner, if you like, or systemically. So basically, we'll say you've got a given ecological health. So now some sort of ecological shock manifests. Uh, that could be through a prolonged drought, such as Af Sub-Saharan Africa has been through, three years of drought during La Nina. Now, societal resilience will determine the ability of it to cope. The societal resilience isn't strong enough. Uh, uh, the lower resilience and then increases the likelihood of conflict or other shocks like economic shocks or political shocks and such these manifest that further degrades the ecology so next time the shock manifests itself there is coping resilience will even be lower so let's have a look at country hotspots we find that there's 15 percent more this year in other words three new countries have become ecological hotspots and they are niger ethiopia and myanmar in these countries there's 1.26 billion people now, obviously, 19 of them are in sub-Saharan Africa, but the next most affected area is the Middle East and North Africa with five. Now, what's interesting, no country actually has a severe score in every one of the domains. However, two countries have multiple areas within their countries where you do get a severe score in every domain, and that's Nigeria and Ethiopia. So now, as I've mentioned, the way we've done this is by looking at the, uh, you're taking the resilience as measured through positive piece, taking the 30 countries with the, uh, well, taking the group of countries with severe shocks, and that's how we arrive at the, uh, 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 the uh, ecological hotspots. So now just to drive it home, here's a map of the world showing uh, with red uh, where each of these the, the, uh, ecological hotspots are. And so, again, you can come back and see they're clustered in uh, 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 sub-Saharan Africa, and also you'll find them up in South Asia and, and uh, partly in the Middle East. So give you an idea of the countries which are these ecological hotspots. As you look through these ones, all of them are actually uh, got suffering from conflict in either greater or lesser extents. Some of them are still recovering from conflicts. But again, it will just drive home that relationship between ecological threats and conflict. So what we find is there's 42 countries facing severe food insecurity. So severe food insecurity is where... 65% or more of the population were unable to afford food for their family for at least one day in the last year. So that, that's a lot. That's within a country. Uh, and we've got more than a billion people living in those countries. Again, because they're in the areas of the high population growth, that number is likely to increase to 2 billion by 2050. And as already mentioned, sub-Saharan Africa uh, has the largest proportion of its population. Uh, and that's literally 85% living with severe food insecurity. So 35 of the 52 countries in sub-Saharan Africa uh, yeah, suffer from food insecurity, to bring it home another way. And food insecurity is also a major cause of conflict. So just to give you an idea of the changes in food price, since 1992, so over the last 20 years, 
They're currently 33% higher than in 2016 at the start of yeah, 2016. So now what we can find here is they're obviously off their peak. This puts incredible strain on the resources of people in the poorest nations to actually be able to afford food. Now, we come back and we look at the number of the uh, yeah, people living with food insecurity. This drives it home again, and you can see the likelihood changes between 2023 and 2050 by the various uh, regions of the world. Note just how more people are living in sub-Saharan Africa than anywhere else in the world and are projected to get so much worse. Let's have a look at water risk. So currently there are 2 billion people living in areas without access to safe drinking water. So just to put that, that's 25% of the population of the planet. We also got about 3.6 billion people. That's nearly half without safe sanitation. So it's worse to, it's expected to get substantially worse in areas like Russia and Eurasia by 2040 with substantial impacts on the uh, agriculture in those areas. Just to really bring this point home. So if we look at the number of countries uh, yeah, using more than 80% of their renewable water, in the last four years, that's increased from 17 to 25%. That's nearly a 50% increase, probably about 47% increase. So that will give you an idea. Certainly places like India, over the next uh, decade, they're expecting a number of the water tables there to collapse. We've got further, we've got damming happening along the major rivers in the world. So the Mekong, for example, uh, it supports 300 million people. And we've got multiple new dams going in there. I think there's seven or eight, which will go in over the next five years. And then we've also got the Nile River, which got 200 million people dependent on most of that in Egypt. So this will give you an idea again of where the water risk lies globally. And again, we can come back and we see sub-Saharan Africa. And we can also see the stress in Southeast Asia. Okay, so let's come back and look at natural disasters. So natural disaster, things like floods, droughts, to tsunamis, earthquakes, and such. So now what we classify as the country where it's got a severe risk is where 5% of the population are likely to suffer from any single natural disaster. To work that out, what we look is at past disasters and we use that as the measure going forward. And what we find, these countries are clustered in a few different areas of the world, like Southeast Asia, Southern Africa, in East Africa, for example. And there's 44 countries which we see as high risk of natural disasters and with low resilience. And these countries, when we look at them, are again, home to half the population of the world. Now, one of the ways of being able to look at this is you can look at the emergency relief funding. And it goes into new, different categories like health, natural disasters, conflict displacement. Natural disasters are consuming more and more of the budget internationally. But you'll notice since 2020, these budgets or overall have dropped quite substantially. In fact, if we look at 2020, look at 2022, the, the uh, yeah, end of 2022, you'll find it's back to the same level what it was in about 2008. Demographic pressures rising, but not globally. So what we find here is that the, we'll find that the population increase, world's population will increase by 25%. But 45% of that growth will be in the least peaceful countries, further fueling a, 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 a resource scarcity in those countries. Now, we look at these 40 least peaceful countries, what we'll find there'll be an additional 1.3 billion people by 2050. In that point, those 40 least peaceful countries will have half the world's population. However, if we look at it, most countries in the world are transitioning to stable or shrinking populations. 
For example, we've got many countries now which have got under 1.5 uh, a year, a year children per women. South Korea, China, Spain, Malta, Singapore, and Spain have the lowest in the world, and this will con this trend will continue. In fact, if we look at it, the population of sub-Saharan Africa uh, for people under 15 will be greater than the entire population of Europe by 2050, fueling uh, some idea of these changes. So just to drive this home further, and I think this is a really important slide, uh, a shift in score of 25%. So if we uh, you get 25% uh, increase in food security, the likelihood of conflict goes up 36%. If you get the same shift to water, then the likelihood of the, uh, 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 of the conflict goes up by 18%. So if the thought of the, if the uh, Water insecurity increases by 25%, likelihood of conflict, 18%. We're looking also, and this has impacts way beyond the regions where, where it's occurring. What we find is with forced displacement through conflict, 30% of the people travel more than 500 kilometres, something like 10% travel more than 2,000 kilometres. So this affects not only the areas in the region, but other adjacent regions as well, such as Europe. And this, again, will give you an idea of just the uh, yeah, areas where you've got active conflicts and also you've got ecological threat. Again, this will give you an idea of the, just the number of people displaced by conflict and natural disasters continues to rise. And you can just see here how steep it is. It's up to about 108 million at the time of producing this report. And that ignores Palestinian refugees and Venezuelan refugees as well. We're just about at the end of the presentation now. So if we look also, we did a study on mega cities. These are going to increase from the 33 up to at least 50 by 2050. And mega cities where there's 10, more than 10 million people. And so what we find is with the fastest growing cities, many of them are yeah, yeah, got low per capita income, which means it's very difficult for them to get the finances to be able to manage the growth. A lot of these, these cities also face high rates of violence, civil unrest, pervasive pollution, poor sanitation, and high population growth. So just to bring this home even further, two countries with the most mega cities with high growth and low per capita income are in Nigeria, the Democratic Republic of the Congo. So also, if we look in the cities, so we look at the five most air polluted cities, and all of these are mega cities with high population growth. The reading of the uh, pollution is 16 times higher than what the WHO recommends. Oh, by the way, all those cities are in Asia with a strong con congregation in Africa. Again, when you look at this, gives you an idea of the cities and their per capita income. And again, it just drives home the difficulty for being able to do urban planning and just be able to put in necessary sewerage and the garbage capture, for example, let alone water into these cities. So we can see a lot of these are situated in Africa, but also over in India. And finally, there's a number of policy recommendations which can come out of all of this to really reverse this current ecological trend. So again, the countries with the highest resilience uh, uh, will manage their way through through the current and emerging ecological shocks. Be simply, they've got the governance the capabilities to do it and the income to be able to afford the necessary infrastructure. But what we need is a better understanding of the societal systems, and that would give us a better understanding in the countries at risk of what are the best ways of being able to ta tackle the environmental outcomes. Uh, for countries with the fastest growing populations, we need to cope culturally appropriate ways of being able to do family planning. And that, in particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, is urgently needed. One of the best ways to look after the poorest of the poorest through micro-water capture. So if we look at sub-Saharan Africa, 
massive amounts of rain fall in the wet season, which are never harvested. If you can harvest the rain, then you can enable food production. That allows for value-added micro-businesses to be created on top of it, and you can do that through cooperatives. So if you can take people that currently have got one crop a year, and sometimes a lot of these people are living living on existing up to a quarter of an acre, and you can now turn that into three, four crops a year. That now is a massive increase in the quality of life of those people and the food availability. And that also gives them excess crops, which they can then use to sell, and that then improves the local economies. We're also, in many of these parts of the world, developing a stronger environmental in entrepreneurial a, a culture would go a long way to help as well. And finally, you're developing these micro projects, you really need to get strong community engagement. And that, my friends, is the end of this presentation. I'll stop sharing my screen now. Thank you for your presentation, Steve. And thank you also for the great questions that are coming in through the Q&A function. Well, the results of the ecological threat report really highlights the grave challenges that we are facing and will be facing. There are some glimmers of hope in the world. There are some really incredible projects that are ongoing that simultaneously reduce the impact of some of these ecological threats and also can help to, to, to manage conflict. And I think our next speaker is really a perfect example of this. Um, so he, next we have Tony Ronaldo, and Tony is going to share with us the history, definition, and the impact of farmer-managed natural regeneration and the links between land degradation and conflict. I'd like to remind everybody again to please continue to use the Q&A function to ask Tony your questions during his presentation. Thank you very much, Tony, the floor is yours. Oh, please don't forget to unmute yourself, Tony. Sorry. So, um, yeah, th thank you for the opportunity, Steve and Leah. It's a great pleasure and an honor to share with you tonight. My wife and I moved to Niger Republic, West Africa in 1980, and we were confronted by a landscape at the point of ecological collapse, one which could barely support life anymore. Even though in my short lifetime, I was only 24 years old then, this had been a biodiverse forest with fertile agricultural land, springs, and even wildlife. So in two short decades, it had been reduced to its knees. Uh, climate change was certainly a factor, although at that time we weren't so aware of that. What we were aware of was the massive land clearing for agriculture as the population grew rapidly. And the consequences of that destruction were very severe. Uh, much, much harder to grow, produce food. Uh, there's a lot of displacement, sometimes conflict, because the land simply didn't support that population. And there was greater uh, competition over scarce resources. At that time, I, I'd struggled with tree planting, but we came across a method of rapidly restoring this landscape, restoring a level of tree cover on this agricultural land, simply by identifying and regenerating uh, trees already in the landscape, sometimes in the forms of dormant seeds, and very often uh, the living tree stumps were able to be regenerated. Uh, so very simple. I won't go into the steps of it, but just a matter of uh, selecting the trees you want to re regrow, pruning the excess stems that come up, protecting it. And then, of course, the incentive for ongoing maintenance of those trees is that the people are able to benefit and utilize from the, those trees. Over a period of 20 years, the method spread across 5 million hectares of agricultural land in Niger. And you can see the dots on the satellite images, tree density increased from less than four per hectare to over 40. So 200 million trees across 5 million hectares without planting a single one. And the communities, the farmers of Niger created this agroforestry parkland, a, a landscape 
capable of supporting crops and livestock in between the trees and became highly productive and much more resilient to climatic shocks. And so over the years, what we witnessed was a, a reversal of, of what had been a downward spiral of degradation, poverty and despair. It, it had reversed into an upward spiral of restoration, relative prosperity and hope. And, and actually hope is a very, very significant factor in motivating people to embrace methods like this. And income wise, again, across that 5 million hectares, the impact was very, very high. Um, individual households earning up to $1,000 extra in gross income across the 5 million hectares, $900 million every year without ongoing project intervention or government support benefiting over four and a half million people every year without fertilizer, irrigation or improved seed, farmers in Niger are growing an additional 500,000 tons of grain, enough to feed two and a half million people. If you have those other resources, irrigation, fertilizer and so on, good and well, the reality is most people in Niger don't have access to that kind of input. And so those results were simply by working with nature instead of fighting against it and destroying it. And the, the flow on impacts have, have been uh, significant also. And you, I think, can, I hope you can uh, read along the top there. I, I can't quite see it, it's blocked out, but um, uh, the traditional conflict between herding uh, cultures and farmers has been very severe. And in my last year in Niger, some 100 people were massacred over a simple incursion of livestock into croplands. And so the, the statement up top, um, insults were our daily diet. Uh, that was the reality for herders in that, in that country. A study was done more recently in Niger in districts which have embraced this method of restoration and conflicts have reduced 70%. And I think it's primarily because instead of dwindling resources that people are competing for, there's an expansion, more water, more food, more fodder, more fuel wood. So there's, there's less reason to fight over resources. Um, this study done in Kenya that found that Farmers in drought years practicing this restoration method were five-fold better off than those without trees on their land. So for a start, in a drought year, they didn't lose their animals to starvation, and the animals were actually able to continue growing and producing milk. And in, in this example in Uganda, uh, this farmer was constantly in conflict with his neighbors. So same tribe all farmers, but he was constantly in conflict with them because his livestock were hungry and they kept wandering into their fields. He began restoring his land, regenerating the trees. He stopped burning and he was able to increase his livestock uh, stocking rate 400%. He increased his income through the animal products. He could now keep beehives and he was selling wood products, firewood, building poles, and so on. And the conflict stopped. His livestock no longer wander anywhere because their needs are met on his own property. Um, a very interesting uh, study done by the World Bank. Um, I just find my notes. So it's, it was a simulation study and they found with productivity technologies such as this re reforestation method, but also methods such as conservation agriculture, and small-scale irrigation, uh, with these technologies, the number of poor, drought-affected people living in 10 dry land countries of West Africa fell, uh, compared to business as usual, fell between 13% and 50%. So again, increasing, improving the productivity of the land increases people's uh, well-being and abil ability to support themselves. And very often there's a direct link there in reducing conflict. Um, 
if we don't reverse the loss of trees, we will have catastrophe. Evergreening is the biggest solution to security. There are fodder trees that can be used for peace between herders and farmers. This quote from Pastor James Wuyin in Nigeria uh, backs up that, that previous World Bank study. And, and again, this other quote, without restoring, uh, and I can't read it, it's hidden behind things, a, a fully, and, and having a fully functional natural environment, the risks of insecurity, instability, and conflict will keep rising. For climate change and biodiversity, this is a critical decade, which makes a critical decade for security as well. And with, with this with this study in Mali, after a terrible massacre, their conclusion was, unless the underlying root causes of land degradation, scarcity of land and land degradation, unless those issues were addressed, the current interventions being applied would be incapable of helping to deliver any sustainable peace in that country. This one's also an interesting study which links a, a vegetation index and incidence of, of uh, violence. So with just a 10% increase in the greenness of a landscape, the, the vegetation in, index, um, conflicts decreased between 17.3 and 10.7%. And a, a big impact of, uh, on women and children and on armed conflicts. So even, even just the greenness of the landscape can be a, a proxy measurement of expected conflicts. There are a number of um, uh, factors that we can work with to try and get people to, to work on land restoration. And market access is a, is a big one. Unless people can make a, a good income or a better income through their efforts in improving their land, they're less likely to adopt these methods. It needs to be shown that the benefits of taking such methods are, are higher than the alternative. In, in other words, they're higher than continuing to destroy the trees and to degrade the land. They need access to a viable restoration technology. I, I didn't go into the farmer managed natural regeneration story in depth, but nobody was listening to us in that context when we were planting trees. It just wasn't viable. 80 to 90% of the trees died. But with this method, because everything that you need to practice it is literally at your feet, and even the poorest farmer can adopt it, then there was very rapid um, uptake by farmers. It, it was accessible, it was viable for them. Farmers need access to sufficient areas of land and with secure perceived tenure of that land. Why improve something that doesn't belong to you? Pe people just won't do that. And then farmers need confidence in being able to control the risks uh, uh, risks such as fire, pests, and theft. So a, a, a very big factor is uh, having enabling policy environment. And one of the blockers in Niger and many other countries is that people simply do not own the trees, even on their own land. And by simply giving people outright ownership, or at the very least, user rights so that they will have the confidence if they invest their time in restoring that landscape they will have the confidence that they will benefit very very simple tweak in the policy but policies often take a long time to, to shift unfortunately um, the creation of bylaws with the communities themselves who can operate in this area how will we manage the trees what are the consequences for non-compliance? We need an all-stakeholder agreement on the rules that we will all abide by. Um, people, uh, by working in organisations or groups such as farmers groups, people have a stronger voice, they have mutual encouragement and can help each other as they adopt new techniques. And then capacity building. Many of these techniques are new to people, and, and so they need training in, in how to practice them. 
uh, development of value chains. And it can be as simple as um, giving people access to, to markets so that they can sell firewood at a fair price to more, more sophisticated markets with um, cosmetics or processed foods and so on. But unless people can derive a better income from practicing these improvements, there's very little motivation for them to do so. Globally, it's estimated there are more than two and a half billion hectares of degraded forest and agricultural land. And rather than despairing, I see this as something with great potential for building prosperous, peaceful and, and stable societies. That's two and a half billion hectares of opportunity to restore that land, to make it more productive and to give people their dignity and to meet basic needs. So while it's certainly challenging, it's an enormous number, uh, it also represents an enormous opportunity to address these, these uh, uh, existential threats. And, and so I guess my call is, <laughs> let's use the wasted energy that goes into conflict and direct it towards a war on land degradation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tony. That was an excellent presentation. Thank you. We'll now open to the audience for questions that they have for both Steve and Tony. Um, perhaps I will choose one for Steve, one for Tony, and then one for both of you as well. Steve, one of the questions that have come in for you is who is at the risk of food insecurity? And how can it be reduced? So I guess if we're looking at it, food insecurity comes back to the poorest of the poor. So it's really strong relationship between poverty and food insecurity. Now, every country in the world has people who are food insecure. That includes places like, let's say, the United States, so you may all the, all, all the uh, uh, democracies in Europe. However, the biggest numbers we find are, as mentioned through the presentation, in sub-Saharan Africa. And so really, when we're looking at this, come back to uh, two types of people. So the first is the uh, these small-scale farmers, uh, which you find out in the in the uh, in the various uh, countrysides of the uh, of the uh, the African nations. The other is in the slums in the very very large cities. So, first thing is you start to see the increases in food prices, and you're living a slum in the cities, and you really uh, basically uh, you've got to learn your money through might be selling things on the street. To be able to cover your food, this has this has a massive impact on your uh, nutrition. I think the other thing which gets tied up with it as well, when you're not getting sufficient food, particularly for kids, it affects the nutrition. That then means the brains don't develop as well. It means because they become adults, they're not as bright as what they could have been, and this then feeds back into cycles of violence as well, because what we find is the uh, 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 the uh, less con emotional control with the lower intelligence. So one of the things we've found in other studies which we've done, when we look at the thinness as a measure of malnutrition, what we find in sub-Saharan Africa is three times more prevalent in the, uh, men than what it is in women. There's a very simple reason for that too. That's simply that women are the ones who cook the food and quite often actually grow the vegetables and such. Therefore, they've got first access to the food. Thank you, Steve. And Tony, a two-part question for you. So over the years, how many sustainable employment opportunities would you say that your projects have created? And then there was also a question about who's been included in your projects. Thanks. Thank you. So I, I, I don't have a, uh, it's very rubbery, but suffice to say millions of people in Niger alone, uh, 6 million hectares today. And you, you saw those figures, uh, four and a half million people earning additional gross income and two and a half million people with better nutrition. Um, through World Vision alone, we've introduced the method to over 29 countries 
and we freely shared with governments, with other organizations and pharma groups. So it, it's certainly in the millions. Um, and, and the second part of the question? Is who is included? There's a specific question about women, indigenous, youth. So, so everybody, but we deliberately target women, children, and indigenous people, uh, and particularly in the case of, well, in, yeah, in that case, they tend to be the traditional custodians of uh, traditional medicines. They know which plants are uh, required for healing. They're the ones who collect fuel wood, wild foods, and so often they're they're the most receptive to embracing th these technologies. They can also earn additional income. Once you start restoring the landscape and the tree cover, you not only meet domestic needs, you have a surplus for sale. So we, we do focus on those groups, women, children, and, and indigenous groups, but we don't exclude men either. <laughs> Excellent. And Steve, back to you. Um, someone has commented, Sub-Sahara uh, Africa is currently suffering from severe ecological threats, but it also has very large young population. So what role do you propose that the youth in Africa could play in building resilience? Well, it's a multi-thronged uh, yeah, uh, yeah, question, isn't it? This, the issue for a lot of them is really very, very high unemployment in uh, yeah, yeah, in sub-Saharan Africa. Really, a lot of it for the youth comes back to how do we go about being able to uh, find them adequate to uh, work so they've got the ability to survive. So there are areas of where uh, we've worked in uh, you know, you know, sub-Saharan Africa where literally the kids from about seven years on have to go out and, sh and scrounge to find the food they're going to eat because the, uh, you know, the, the poverty is so poor. Uh, like Things like putting a, a, your programs in in schools uh, where you just put a bit of porridge in at lunchtime. That will actually attract a lot more kids to school because the parents realise at least they'll get some food. And then with the education, it just means the brain stays that much more alive. But there's difficult questions. There are systemic questions as well. This comes back to a whole range of things. And it's different from different uh, yeah, parts of society. But a lot of it comes back to sort of being able to improve the governance, being able to improve the business opportunities for youth, uh, uh, it's about back to being able to increase the yield from the land because they increase the yield, then you've got more people can actually uh, live from it. Quite often what's happening, and on also there's a need to be able to reduce the high population growth. So I don't know if I mentioned in the presentation, but it's currently a year, four children a year per woman. That's down from five women 25 years ago, but it's still... Uh, a way too way too high, and so the whole what happens is historically many parts of Africa. If you're if you're a farmer, for example, historically when your kids became of age, you gave them some of the land, and that was fine. Well, populations were fairly well balanced, but the blocks have become smaller and smaller and smaller. So they're unsustainable now. So the kids quite often migrate to the cities, and they're not migrating there through opportunity. They're migrating uh, uh, simply because they've got nowhere else to go to try and search for some form of employment. And then we have, then quite often you've got the slums, which are increasing across many of the cities. They're unplanned. The countries themselves have got low per capita income, so they can't really afford to put in the necessary urban planning. Uh, like That's just really being able to get gar clean, garbage cleaned up being able to get appropriate sanitation or even clean water. Uh, uh, traffic jams in these cities, are really, some of them are shocking, like it can be two, three hours to get from one part of the city to another. And then you don't know how long it's going to take. It might take one and a half hours one day and four hours the next. It's, it, it, it's tough. So what you've got to do really for the youth unemployment, you've got to come back. You've got to look at the uh, the, the countries. The areas you're looking at, they all have different societal systems and you really need to understand what are the right drivers to be able to able to fix it. So you need holistic approaches to it and you can't 
come up with any right card anyway. Maybe someone else is smarter than me. But I can't come up with one silver bullet saying this is what you should do and that'll work everywhere. If anybody has that silver bullet, please let us know. <laughs> and Tony, the next question is for you. Um, could your projects and best practices be used outside of sub-Saharan Africa? And if so, where would they be the most relevant? Mm -hmm. Most definitely. So it, it is true that the greatest uptake so far has been in African countries. And even within Africa, there's greater uptake in the drier, more marginal lands. I think people have fewer options and the impact in those dry areas is very significant. And, and so greater uptake there. But we, we've also in, uh, promoted it in Asian countries, India, Myanmar, Indonesia, East Timor, and in, in Latin America as well. Um, it, it, I, I didn't create the term farmer managed natural regeneration, but it's very appropriate. It's not Tony managed or government managed. And so the shape, what it will actually look like in a different context will be very, very different and will be shaped by the objectives of the farmer, him or herself, uh, the species and, and the climate there. And, and so, yes, it's very applicable across the world. And I, I would argue, not just for environmental reasons, uh, it makes economic sense. It improves the productivity of the land and it gives land users greater options. Excellent. Thank you. There's two more questions that we'll get to if we have time. The next one is for both of you. Could you give some examples or perhaps recommendations as to what governments or international organizations could do to specifically improve water scarcity? Steve, would you like to go first and then Tony? Sure, more than happy. So I'll start with the water scarcity and come back to the governments. So with the water scarcity, it's, I, I, so, look, quite often I meet with a lot of the largest uh, developmental agencies in the world, and they tend to get focused on really big projects. And so I was in talking to one group just recently, and they're looking at sort of the uh, how do they spend half a billion dollars uh, uh, stimulating uh, uh, small businesses. The way they do it is they then go to a bank and give it to loans. And so that's fine if you're looking at your middle class business people because they've got bank accounts and they, 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 they can do it. The issue is when you're getting down to the small scale farmers, that's really where we need to look at being able to help because that's the poorest of the poor. But for most, most of the large developmental organisations, and these are, the, these, these are the international development organisations more so than uh, yeah, charities or foundations such as uh, World Vision, uh, uh, they haven't got the ability really to be able to uh, uh, reach in because the way the money's given to them, you've got all sorts of governance around it. It's very, and they can't actually do the governance if they're giving out working in areas where they're working on something which might be $10,000 to capture more water for a community, for a small community. I think the other thing also coming into this too, and this applies uh, across the board, it's all, also, also for the yeah, 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 no, uh, all, for all sorts of aid, aid organisations, NGOs, they don't actually really understand business. So they don't understand how you can actually go about creating water businesses. They know about sort of having, uh, you're focusing on giving loans to the uh, yeah, poorest people to try and develop the, uh, small businesses, but that's very, very different than being able to try and stimulate an economy by getting the money the people who are the most, the best entrepreneurs, and they're the ones who actually would really grow the economy. And sometimes they will be the ones with the most get up and go. Whereas for NGOs, they're looking at the people with the let's say disabilities and others like that, uh, which is good, but it's not necessarily putting the money in the hands of the ones who are most productive. Uh, when we come back and look at governments, uh, I think there's a, 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 a the Lack of the good governance and corruption in many of these countries is a real impediment on their ability to be able to uh, uh, perform. 
Other thing is the lack of rule of law. And a lot of that can be tied up with the uh, corruption and can be tied up with the weak governance as well. So a lot of the time, I'll come back and I said it earlier on, these are systemic. This is a whole range of things which need to be tackled simultaneously. We'd use the positive peace framework, which we've got as the mechanism through which to be able to look at what do you need to tackle to really be able to improve the way a government or a country actually operates. Great, thank you. Tony? Yeah, thank you. So um, m most countries ac actually don't receive less rainfall than they used to. Maybe it's more erratic, but the total is more or less the same. Uh, what's happening with land degradation is 80% of that water and sometimes more either, either evaporates or runs off. Now, governments and maybe business tend to think in terms of let's create more dams, bigger storage, Perhaps there's a place for that, but I strongly argue for massive investment and policy uh, improvement for land restoration. We we have a project in Ethiopia that's only 500 hectares, and it, it's it's a water tower, so it's a mountain area. It's been de uh, deforested, and when it rains, it floods downstream, and when there's a dry patch, there's a severe shortage of water. Within a few years of restoring the vegetation on that hill, nine springs, which had been intermittent, now flow for the whole year, every year. Um, just by restoring the vegetation cover and building up the organic matter in the soil, which acts like a sponge, absorbing that excess moisture when it comes in heavy rainfall, and then slowly releasing it when there's a dry spell, just by doing that can have an enormous impact. And, and so I, I would have an emphasis on restoring particularly these hilly water towers, but the whole landscape itself, if it's relatively healthy in an ecological sense, it acts as an enormous water reserve, buffering the extremes of too much and too little water. Incredible. Both of those messages are ones that I hope that we'll hear at the upcoming COP28 as well. That being said, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today and to Steve and Tony for sharing their expert insights with us. You can visit visionofhumanity.org to download the Ecological Threat Report as well as Steve's slides that you saw today. And you can learn more about IEP's other upcoming events. We thank you again, and we hope to see everybody soon. Thank you. Great. Thanks for having us on, Leah. Thank you.